Friday the 11th of March 2011, a major earthquake hit Japan's east coast. It was the most powerful the country had ever seen. It triggered a 40-meter tsunami that wrecked everything in its way. Residents were given just an eight-minute warning. The tsunami would go on to claim the lives of around 20,000 people. With a 40-foot wave, those close to the impact didn't stand much of a chance. For weeks, there was chaos and devastation, and thousands of people would never even be found. Japan was facing a major crisis. Thousands were missing, entire towns had been wiped out, and crucial infrastructure had been destroyed. But a few hundred kilometers down the coast, another disaster was unfolding. A 15-meter wave hit the Fukushima nuclear power station. It caused a series of fires and explosions. Three of the six nuclear reactors began melting, and radiation was starting to leak. The government declared an emergency and an immediate evacuation of the surrounding areas. Over 150,000 people were forced to leave their homes, most never to return. It's been almost a decade since the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Our team was given rare access to one of Japan's most restricted and controversial areas. I wanted to find out why the majority of the residents were not willing to return to Fukushima and what the government was doing to help those affected by the second worst nuclear disaster of our time. So later I'm talking about the radiation. We left Tokyo and drove three hours towards the exclusion zone. I was given a Geiger counter, an instrument used to measure radiation levels. On the outskirts of Tokyo, it showed a reading of 0.09, which is perfectly normal for any major city. But as we approached the surrounding areas of the exclusion zone, the atmosphere changed. Roads were closed and checkpoints became frequent. Those outside of their vehicles were wearing protective clothing. The evacuation order in Tomioka was lifted in 2013, but the place is still eerily quiet. The vegetation has grown wild and houses are clearly still empty. Hiroko Nakayama was born and raised a few kilometers away from the Fukushima nuclear plant. She, like many others, was forced to evacuate Tomioka town after the disaster. But in 2013, Hiroko was told she could return to her home. She thought her nightmare was finally over. This seemed like a good place to live two years ago. But in fact, the last two years have been tremendously difficult for me. Lots of people say they wonder if they'll ever return and if they'd meet their loved ones again. In reality, no one has returned here not even when the restrictions were lifted and it had become a town where people could live in once more, or it had become livable once again. It's obvious that no one will ever want to return. So in fact, for me, the past two years have been more difficult than any other since the earthquake. Some residents have settled elsewhere and have no reason to start over again, but others still have concerns about the levels of radiation. Although the government claims the area is now safe, many former residents don't trust those in charge. Hiroko believes that there should be more information out there for people to make up their own minds. The government says that the radiation levels in the town are safe and of no concern to health. I believe that the number of people who are scared of radiation is exaggerated. But no one has or understands the data. So I've had to decide my own path, depending on whether or not I believe it's safe. Although the numbers are low, some people are afraid of the radiation levels, especially people from outside the Fukushima prefecture. But I believe that they just don't understand what's going on. 
and we have the chance to explain the situation to them. As we continued our journey towards the no-go zone, there were constant reminders of the suffering that took place. It soon becomes evident of just how little time the people had to get out. Restaurant boards still advertise the lunchtime special. A peek through a school window and you can see pictures of smiling children on the classroom walls. But the streets are totally deserted and desolate. Possessions are scattered across the homes and some shops have been looted. When you're here you really get a sense of how eerily quiet the place is. It is quite literally a ghost town and also you can realize just how quickly people left this place. They locked up their businesses and their homes and they ran. There is still shoes when you look through the door. There's still cutlery everywhere. This was clearly a place that people used to come and socialize uh, and just get the normal kind of things done. There's a salon outside, there's a restaurant across the road. All of that now has just been abandoned. It's quite depressing driving around the Fukushima area. I had hoped that those responsible, like the Tokyo Electric Power Company, would have done their bit to rebuild the region, or that the government would be doing more to kickstart the community. The towns are still a mess, and it's hardly a suitable area to live, work, or raise a family, but not everyone is disheartened. Katsumi Anakawa grows and sells flowers. He, like many others, was forced to move. But he returned and his hope is that others follow his lead. The worst and most difficult part of it all was that I couldn't help anyone once we were forced to leave. I desperately wanted to return here to save more people. I'm very grateful for the support we received from TEPCO and the government. We were able to build a new house with the subsidies provided by the government. I would love to be able to go back to the good old days, everyone happy and laughing together once again. I want to see Fukushima thrive as it once did before the earthquake, and I'll endeavour to see it happen however hard I must try. As we got closer to the no-go zone, we saw the Fukushima Daiichi power plant, which was operated by a company called TEPCO. Surrounded by cranes, it is slowly being dismantled. It's estimated that the removal operation and cleanup process could take another 40 years. Well, we're going through the no-go zone right now, and this is the most radiation so far that we've been uh, exposed to, and you can clearly see why the authorities don't want anybody to be in this area. The main exclusion zone has its own security checkpoints. The only vehicles going in or out are the ones involved in the cleanup process. In 2016, the Japanese government and TEPCO said the nuclear disaster had cost the country $400 billion. With another 30 or 40 years to go, it's quite possible to see that figure running into the trillions. These fields used to be for farming and harvesting crops. But these days, they are home to thousands of bags of radioactive soil. The workers painstakingly gather up the soil and then it's crushed and placed into these black sacks. The government has promised to eventually move the radioactive waste, but they are still trying to find a town or city willing to take it. It's hardly surprising that the locals are reluctant to move back to an area containing millions of cubic meters of radioactive soil. The operation is done away from the public and limited information is given. If I was a local, I wouldn't risk coming back here either. On our way out, we passed a school which was hit by the tsunami. The clock on the wall is stuck at 3.38 p.m. That was the time the wave struck. But in this tragedy, there is a tale of human spirit at its best. When the children at this school knew the tsunami was heading their way, their orders were to wait inside this playground, leave the classroom and come and stand here. But when the kids got here, they realized that they weren't going to make it if they stayed put. So they decided to make a run for it. Uh, it's around two kilometers to get to higher ground to the mountains. The kids that were aged between 12 and 14 decided that's what they needed to do to survive. In doing so, many locals saw all of the kids running to the mountains and assumed they had some better knowledge and followed. So these children effectively saved the lives of hundreds of people. 
Chihiro Yoshida is a tour guide for Japan Wonder Travel. The group takes tourists around the exclusion zone. Like Chernobyl, Fukushima became an attraction to many after the rise in dark tourism. Japan Wonder Travel introduces its guests to local farmers and residents to give them a first-hand feel of what it's like to live at Ground Zero. Chihiro has been coming to Fukushima for years and even she says she's losing faith. My first time I came here, it was, I thought, I think a very sad, but now, um, yeah, yesterday we saw the locals, but she said also now it's more sad, because I thought the people coming back, and the number of the people is getting higher and higher, but mm, still, no, the same level as before, two years ago. So now I need to find another hope here. We need to create a job or other things. As our journey came to an end, we headed back towards the coast. This is where the tsunami came in, and this is where it all began. It's crazy to think that just eight years ago, people were given a 40 minute warning to save their lives from a 40 meter wave. And you kind of put yourself in that situation and you think, how would you get out of there? How would you find your friends and your family? And it's terrifying. And you can't help but think, having been here, that the survivors, the ones who, some call them the lucky ones, well, that's the wrong word completely to use for them. Their lives have been turned upside down. They've lost loved ones. They've lost their homes, their jobs, everything. And they still haven't come back. And, Having been here, having experienced all the different towns and, and spoken to all the different people, you just get this feeling that the government and TEPCO could be doing a lot more. 